Good afternoon. My name is Monique King Veland, and I'm the Director of State and Local Housing Policy for the Urban Institute. And I'm also the moderator for the Revitalizing and Reimagining the DMV After COVID-19 event series. Before we start, some quick housekeeping. The event is being recorded and the recording will be posted online afterwards. Speaker bios are available online at urban.org and a link to the bios will be posted in the chat. The live transcript feature is available so you can hide captions or adjust with the live transcript options as needed. All participants are muted, but you can send questions or comments in the Q&A box at any time. And we hope to have enough time for audience Q&A at the end. And finally, if you tweet about the event today, please tweet using the hashtag live at urban. In 2020, the APM Research Lab launched a project called The Color of Coronavirus that monitors how and where the COVID-19 mortality is inequitably impacting certain communities. COVID-19 has claimed more than half a million lives. And they have documented the race and ethnicity of 94% of these cumulative deaths in the United States. According to the APM, Pacific Islanders, Latinx, and Black and Indigenous Americans all have a COVID-19 death rate at double or more than that of white and Asian Americans who experience the lowest age adjusted rates nationally. And according to APM, as of March 2nd, approximately 15% of COVID-19 deaths in the US have been among African Americans. Nationwide, Black people have died at 1.2 times the rate of white people. At least 73,000 Black lives lost to COVID-19 to date. The National Academy of Sciences has projected that the COVID-19 pandemic shortened the 2020 life expectancy in the US by 1.1 years. The loss of life was not distributed evenly though. Black Americans experienced a decrease of 2.1 years, three times that of white Americans. By all accounts, the data suggests that Black Indigenous people of color are dying at higher rates of COVID-19 across the country. And sadly, the greater DC region is no different. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, just looking at the African American population, African Americans make up 45% of the DC population, yet we are 76% of the COVID related deaths. African Americans make up 30% of the state of Maryland population, yet we are 35% of the COVID related deaths. And in Virginia, African Americans make up 19% of the population, yet we are 24% of the COVID related deaths. And this is the situation now even as vaccine distribution is ramping up across the United States. But of vaccinations with reported race and ethnicity data as of March 1st, African-Americans make up only 26% of those in the district who have been vaccinated. Likewise, black residents make up only 17% of Marylanders who have received the coronavirus vaccine. And in Virginia, just 13% of those receiving the vaccine were reported to be Black. As one of our panelists, George Jones, noted, the pandemic has laid bare a second public health crisis, the full impact of systemic racism. As someone who is both African American and immune compromised, as well as a practitioner deeply committed to dismantling structural racism, I have followed this issue closely, both personally and professionally. So I am truly looking forward to today's conversation. Our panelists this afternoon will provide a contextualized understanding of vaccine distribution efforts underway in the greater DC region. And given the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on black indigenous people of color, we will also discuss how the region can promote and undertake equitable COVID-19 vaccine distribution. I am honored to be joined by three incredible panelists. Our first panelist is Jennifer Haley. Jenny 
is a research associate in the Health Policy Center here at Urban. Her work includes assessing how states and communities can improve health equity in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, barriers to enrollment in publicly subsidized health insurance coverage, coverage gaps for postpartum women, and challenges to assessing the safety net for children and immigrant families. Jenny holds an MA in sociology from Temple University. George Jones has been the chief executive officer of Bread for the City since January, 1996. Bread for the City is a nonprofit that provides food, clothing, medical, legal, and social services to DC residents living on low incomes. Under George's leadership, Bread for the City has taken on the challenge of attacking poverty through a racial equity lens. The agency is committed to embedding racial equity in all of its direct services and its efforts to organize around and advocate for affordable housing. Bread for the City is a vaccine distribution facility in the District of Columbia. George is also a founding member of the DC Initiative on Racial Equity and Local Government, and he has a BA in psychology from Norfolk State University in Norfolk, Virginia. And our last panelist, though certainly not least, is Dr. Travis Gales. Dr. Gales is the health officer and chief of public health services for Montgomery County, Maryland. A 1997 Ron Brown scholar, he received his BA in public policy studies and African-American studies from Duke University a PhD in community health, health policy, and an MD from the University of Illinois. Before joining his current role in 2017, Dr. Gale served as the chief medical officer for the DC Department of Health's HIV and AIDS, hepatitis, STD, and tuberculosis administration. He currently holds faculty appointments at NYU, John Hopkins University, and the University of Maryland. Please join me in virtually welcoming our panelists. So let's start with Jenny. I've shared some insights high level about the impact of COVID on black indigenous people of color communities in the greater DC region. But can you shed some more specific light on this impact and also the implications that the disproportionate impact says about the need for equitable approach to vaccine distribution? Sure, thanks, Monique. Well, the pandemic has certainly laid bare structural inequities nationwide and in the DC region. We see that in the COVID impacts that you mentioned. Um, a few factors that might explain some of the disproportionate risk of infection and mortality are overrepresentation in occupations with greater virus exposure, um, higher density residences, more multi generational households that can increase transmission risks and underlying health disparities. Now those are themselves often due to things like lack of health insurance, limited access to culturally appropriate care, and a host of factors like poverty, uh, housing instability and food insecurity, and the stress that results from living with racism. So I think our country is coming to grips with the fact that structural racism is a root cause behind these deep inequities. So now it's essential that we focus vaccinations on those communities that have been hardest hit and to reduce their disproportionate disease burden. So, so far we're seeing a variety of approaches across the region, increasingly focused specifically on equity, but we're still seeing inequities for a variety of reasons, including structural barriers like lack of internet access, <clears throat> excuse me, transportation, indicating we need even stronger efforts moving forward. So um, one last point, I will say we really need better data. As you said, we do have data to suggest large inequities, but they're still incomplete. For instance, in DC, a lot of the vaccinations are going to people who live out of state out of DC, and we don't know how that plays into the inequities. And some data don't even include information on race and ethnicity. In DC, almost half, of the records are missing ethnicity. So we don't even know the extent of the disparities there. In Virginia, it's about a third. So we won't know the full story until the data are more complete. Thank you, Jenny. That's a good segue um, to George. 
George, as someone who leads an organization that is on the front lines of vaccine distribution in DC, can you talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing on the front lines in terms of who is getting vaccinated and who's not getting vaccinated? Um, yes, you know, early on, um, back in, I guess, January, really, it wasn't when in earnest the vaccine was rolled out in DC, maybe, maybe late December, but for all intents and purposes, it was in January when we started to get access at our own clinic to the vaccine. And initially we saw uh, not, all, not just a disproportionate number of, of white residents come to our clinic, but almost uh, exclusively were white residents who showed up at our clinic, which was surprising because we don't have, all, for all intents and purposes, we don't actually have any white patients uh, for our clinic. And so it was, a, an, it was a really a flipping of the script, so to speak, to see that happen. And of course, we realized pretty quickly that was being sort of replicated all across the country in virtually any jurisdiction in the country. And so, um, so that was the sort of, you know, real um, you know, flag that was sort of, in, that was fired or raised when it came to this idea of, you know, even in, when it comes to the vaccine, we were seeing disproportionality play itself out in, in adverse ways. Uh, I, the good news is that the district and the Department of Health pretty quickly uh, responded to that trend here locally, at least when it comes to clinics like Bread for the City. So we were allowed to get out of actually the uh, internet portal pretty quickly within a week or so, uh, and essentially reach out to our own community members to get them into the, to our clinic. And so now we've seen probably between 70, 80% of the folks who routinely show up for the vaccine are black and brown people and people who come from the communities that we historically serve. Uh, so, so that's a good trend. And I think the lesson there is that uh, you have to be intentional and you have to anticipate that if, if left to its own demise, uh, our society is already sort of has baked into it inequities that play themselves out. And so you can't just assume that you put out, for instance, something that's as vital as this vaccine uh, and make it accessible through the internet and that you're not gonna see the kind of disparities that are typical in this country play themselves out. Thank you, George. Dr. Gales, um, I'm wondering if the, the, demographic, the demographic data in Montgomery County mirrors the data that we're seeing in the state of Maryland in terms of the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on Black, Indigenous people of color. So first, thank you, Monique, for the question and thank you for the opportunity to be here with you all and with the uh, distinguished panelists uh, here. Uh, so the demographics that we've seen in terms of the COVID cases, as well as the number of cases, the COVID related fatalities, as well as the early uh, numbers in terms of who was getting vaccinated does mirror what's happening in other areas, unfortunately. Uh, we did see consistent with Jenny, well, how she mentioned all of those different factors that drive disproportionate impact in certain communities. Uh, Montgomery County is a microcosm of all those different kinds of things in terms of being a densely populated county with a million folks, lots of multi-generational homes, uh, questions about affordable housing. So you have lots more people fitting in spaces than were originally designed, uh, as well as a high number of essential employees, both who work in our county as well as other areas who we've asked to go to work throughout the pandemic and who have not had the luxury and opportunity of paid sick leave, the option to telework and actually good stable access to medical care uh, to get testing and those other types of resources. Unfortunately, uh, we along with others haven't necessarily learned the lessons from that. And so we did see that early on in the distribution of vaccines. Uh, we actually created an equity framework within a week, similar to how DC pivoted to address those issues to uh, ensure that we were seeing more fair, equitable access in terms of those doses, at least that the health department had to communities and zip codes that have been hit hardest by COVID uh, in relation to numbers of cases as well as fatalities to ensure that those who have been exposed the most because of again, all those factors that were mentioned did also have opportunities to get vaccines. Now, one of the other things that we've continued to promote here, recognizing those differences and you know, to George's point about how they, their initial uh, rollout of vaccines, simply putting a vaccine distribution place in an area 
where lots of black and brown people live is not a, a good enough to ensure equity. Um, there are other steps that are needed. And for example, in Maryland, there's been lots of conversation about mass vaccination sites. They do provide an opportunity for thousands of people to get access to it. But for example, the site that was put up in Prince George's at the Six Flags site, uh, after the first couple of weeks, I think after you know the first 35,000 or so folks were vaccinated, only 3,000 of those folks lived in Prince George's County. And selfishly for me, 10,000 of them were Montgomery County residents, which I'm happy and excited that our folks are getting vaccines, but that wasn't the original design in terms of having uh, equitable access. So that's where we stand. Um, we're working much like everybody else to pivot quickly and put in solutions that address those disparities. Thank you, Dr. Gales. Jenny, um, so we talked about the gap that exists between the populations of Black, Indigenous, people of color in the greater DC region versus the disproportionate COVID-related deaths um, and the low vaccination rates uh, within those communities. I was reading a recent article in the Washington Post um, from earlier in the month that noted that Governor Hogan repeatedly cites vaccine hesitancy among minority groups as the key cause for lagging rates saying at one point that African-Americans and Latino residents in Prince George's County who represent 84% of that population are quote, refusing to take the vaccine. From your perspective, what does the data indicate about vaccine hesitancy and what are some of the factors that are driving inequitable vaccine distribution in the greater DC region? Sure, thanks. Well. I will share information from a December Urban Institute study found indeed higher hesitancy among non utterly black respondents nationally, as well as among Republicans. Um, but the survey also found that many black respondents seem to still be considering their decisions at that point. And newer information from January and February from a Census Bureau data source indicates that vaccine, vaccine hesitancy rates are declining, including among non utterly black adults. Now in the urban survey, the most common concerns among all the groups, including white people who are in fact the majority of vaccine hesitant adults were about side effects and safety. Now that data source can't look at the DC metro area specifically, but we used the other census data and looked at the reasons for vaccine hesitancy. And they do seem fairly similar for the DMV as they are nationwide. Many are citing concerns about side effects or wanting to just wait and see. Um, certainly Black Americans have very legitimate concerns stemming from our country's awful history of uh, exploitation and medical research, medical treatment. And also um, it's not just about the past, you know, a, a bad experience, feeling mistreated or having pain ignored in, in the present can lead to mistrust in the healthcare system. and in the government. But I would say the data seem to indicate that a lot of what we describe as vaccine hesitancy seems to be rooted more in a lack of information or in barriers getting access. So people have genuine questions about safety and efficacy, but um, do they have a trusted healthcare provider or someone else that they can look to to answer those questions? Urban research found about half of vaccine hesitant people trust their healthcare providers for information about vaccines, but then black, black and Latinx vaccine hesitant adults were less likely to have a usual source of care than their white counterparts. So I think um, better efforts to focus on addressing people's concerns, providing clear and factual information and using trusted sources in the community uh, would really help. Um, moreover, it doesn't matter if you want to be vaccinated if you can't get to the vaccination site because you don't have transportation or you can't get time off work or if the information about the vaccine distribution is not in the language you speak or the sign up opportunities are online and you don't have technology access, especially given racial and ethnic uh, disparities in internet access or maybe you don't have the time to navigate a complicated system. So. Um, the initial sign up and distribution systems disadvantaged people without internet access or computers or resources to travel. And to me, that's not refusing to take the vaccine, that's a lack of access. 
So I think we need to understand and address the structural barriers by listening to the, pe the reasons people aren't accessing the vaccines and get their input on solutions to make, a, make sure they're available to everyone. Thanks, Jenny. I wanna turn back to George. Um, George, I've read the recent opinion piece um, in the Washington Post where you talked about the work that Bread for the City is doing um, to really towards moving towards more racial equity and vaccine distribution. And you mentioned some of it earlier with getting outside of the portal and what you've seen. Can you just talk a little bit more about those efforts and how you got at sort of that 70, 80% number, what you're doing? So maybe we can understand what can also be replicable. Sure. I, I think that uh, it's important to note, uh, as Jenny said, that, um, you know, I, I don't think that I, in our ways, I don't think that the issue is hesitancy. There may be hesitancy. I'm sure there is in all communities. But uh, one of the biggest issues is that there, particularly early on, there just wasn't enough vaccine anyway. And so at the heart of was the matter that we were sort of uh, really struggling with the fact we in DC and across the country were struggling with the fact that we had such a small uh, percentage of vaccine being rolled out. And so suddenly now you're, you're effectively, you're sort of choosing between people and who's deserving and who's not. And so, um, so that, that was, that, you know, that was less than ideal and something that just has to be said outright. But I think the other thing that is important about the messages we've heard today is, you know, we need to know that there's a lot of misinformation, particularly in the black community, I mean, one of the things we found is that there's misinformation about the vaccine. And so, it, uh, and so with people getting information from the internet or from uh, secondhand information from people hearing kind of these, these, these narratives that are, you know, that are troubling, uh, it could really sort of contribute to people having had hesitancy, understandably. And so we, at Bread, we, we really figured out that you have to be able to talk to your community members about and try to get them real information and factual information and scientific information about the vaccine and what the risks are and aren't. Uh, and when we've been able to do that, when we've been able to reach out to people and not have to, to use sort of a, if you will, a, um, a digital approach to that, uh, we, we got people pretty quickly starting to sort of say yes to the vaccine uh, and to show up and get the vaccine. I, I, I personally had several people who talked to me directly and I don't actually talk to our patients that frequently, but I had enough of them asked me about the vaccine once I had gotten the shot. And several of them said subsequently that after talking to me, they felt a lot more comfortable getting it and went on to get it. So, so relationships really matter is what we found out. Uh, and that's one of the things that we've really uh, prioritized is not just people like me and not just our, our, our clinical staff, but ask people to talk to their community members and their family members once they've had the vaccine, because that is one of the ways to really get people comfortable with this sort of, you know, this new healthcare intervention that for all of us, we've never had to, to you know, to sort of um, accept. The other thing that I think is really important to say is as the doctor, as our chief medical officer said is, you know, in a lot of ways, the pandemic is a symptom, the, uh, the disparities in the vaccine is a symptom. We talked earlier, Jenna talked earlier about the real issue is that the, the extreme poverty and, uh, and income and social economic disparities that people, we're experiencing before the pandemic really made folks so vulnerable to uh, the things like disparities in contracting the disease and dying from the disease. And so I, I think the biggest lesson we need to learn sort of systemically and governors uh, like the governor of, Mar uh, of Maryland and, and poli uh, policymakers across the country, uh, including those in the White House is that we have to have a, a recommitment to fighting uh, extreme income in inequality and poverty, because those are the things that make our community members so vulnerable to any of the crises that play themselves out, whether it's a pandemic or an economic crisis, that the stage is already set. There's already a, a, an uneven playing field that makes people of color in particular, black people in DC in particular, so vulnerable to the worst case scenarios that play themselves out when these crises happen. So we need to be recommitted to fighting poverty uh, that is the root of all of these issues and, and fighting um, socioeconomic disparities so that when we have crisis and, and another one's going to come, we know, you know, in the coming years, there'll be something else. And if we haven't recommitted to having equitable um, access in this country and in, in cities like Washington, D.C. and like the BMV, uh, we're going to see these disparities play themselves out again and again and again. Thank you.
Thank you, George. Dr. Gales, I want to turn to you from, from your vantage point as the health officer in Montgomery County. What do you think is driving the low vaccination rates among Black, Indigenous, people of color? And you mentioned a little bit about the equitable framework that Montgomery County is taking. Can you talk a little bit about that equitable framework and how that's working? Sure. I just want to first again say the answers that Jenny and George gave already have set me up nicely for this uh, in terms of the depth of of the factors driving us, uh, because the disparities that we're seeing in COVID are not new. They were here last year. They were here five years ago, 20 years ago, and 40 years ago. And we in the public health world have gotten good at renaming them, you know, whether we talk about them disparities or equity or inequity or inefficiencies, but we haven't been very good at coming up with strategies to address the real causes of those particular things. And to George's point about poverty and socioeconomic disparities, it really is an issue of, you know, we need to come up with holistic strategies working with uh, our intergovernmental partners, our community partners to create strategies that address social determinants of health or whatever the buzz, the, the new buzzword is to describe those things. We know that housing security, food insecurity, access to jobs, access to jobs with meaningful health insurance and paid leave are things that are impactful in these spaces. Uh, whether we're talking about COVID, heart disease, pedestrian safety, maternal and infant health, those continue to be the drivers. And it's incumbent upon us to do the heavy lifting and to do the work to come up with those comprehensive strategies to address those issues. And so part of what we have tried to do is in our effort to promote the scientific and the clinical components of the pandemic response is pair those with social support. And so take utilizing opportunities to address uh, you know, your whole picture, your whole person health model uh, in this as much as we promote testing and getting vaccinated. Uh, and so to those strategies as it relates to an equity framework for vaccine distribution, uh, let me first say the announcement that the governor made is just not accurate um, and has been part of a short-sighted equity strategy that the state has taken that we have pushed back against and we've asked for more uh, actions you know, quite frankly, having a clinic at a church is not enough. A one-time clinic at a church is not enough because we know that our people in our communities utilize different spaces. And so instead, you know, working with a broader network of community partners who do have footprints in communities and are trusted spaces uh, where it creates opportunities to have those candid conversations about what people's fears are, what their concerns are. So the notion of hesitancy being the sole reason or the leading reason why people aren't getting vaccinated is just not correct. Uh, and the second component of that is, uh, and it's interesting, there was, I think it's Goucher College put out a poll in Maryland a couple of weeks ago that said, in fact, the highest percentage of vaccine hesitant folks in Maryland are white Republican men. And so that, doesn't match up with that, that notion uh, to explain fully the disparities within, within communities. So I think the first thing that I would say is a continued um, effort and to address those barriers in getting people physically to get vaccinated, as well as addressing those other issues that people may encounter. So in addition to setting up our larger sites that allow for us to get thousands of people through on a daily basis, we've also been working with community partners to do homebound vaccination. Uh, we set up a model to do homebound testing earlier in the pandemic, and we've used that model to try to, 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 uh, to get out and, and do homebound testing for individuals, whether they're seniors or individuals with their medical conditions who are limited in terms of getting to those spaces. We've also been doing a lot of vaccination on site for independent living facilities, particularly for those seniors who uh, are limited in that. We've been working with our leaders in our municipalities as well as our affordable housing coalition to identify high volume buildings and spaces where we know that lots of residents, particularly unfortunately who are black and brown, live to be able to increase opportunities for them to get vaccinated. Um, as well as being mindful, for example, when we think about access to right now in our prioritization group, essential employees are part of that group and making sure that we've got some creative strategies that aren't just, hey, we have a site here, come see us, 
but you know, working with the employers to make sure that because they may be hourly and they don't have leave, making sure that they're flexible to allow their workers and staff to be able to take time off or not have that counted against them so that they can go get vaccinated. Again, given that we have asked them, these folks to continue to be present and work to provide us our luxuries and necessities throughout the pandemic. So that's the, the approach we've taken. The equity framework has prioritized, we've called them top tier or tier one zip codes. And again, using epidemiologic data and surveillance data, we've identified those zip codes that have been hit the hardest throughout the pandemic, as well as recently, in terms of case counts, hospitalizations, as well as COVID related fatalities. So we will continue to use that framework. We have, we did catch some grief early on because folks were saying that is a racist strategy um, in terms of being able to utilize that. And what we've countered with is to say the data, anytime in public health or clinical practice, when data shows you what, if there are particular risk factors there, you design your clinical solution and your, your ultimate public health solution to address those risk factors first. And unfortunately, and it's clear here in our community and the region is that race and ethnicity have played a role in terms of being risk factors for disproportionate impact in those communities. Thank you, Dr. Gales. I would be remiss, um, especially at Urban Institute, if I didn't lift up that you just talked about the importance of data um, and data and sort of being able to underpin strategies, suggestions, policies, practices, and programs. Um, yes, uh, just how important that is. Um, I want to be able to turn now um, to questions uh, from the audience. I know we do have one question that I see right now in the Q&A box. I would encourage anyone, please uh, feel free to submit your questions or comments in the Q&A box. So we do have a few minutes to answer those. Uh, one of the questions right now is, would interpretation services and the use of AI translation technology help with the miscommunication with these groups? Um, could it help to build trust with those in the community if they can ask questions in their own language? Um, Jenny, maybe I will um, start with you because um, I think you mentioned sort of language challenges and translation, but George or Dr. Gales, feel free to answer this question as well. But Jenny, let's start with you. Sure, absolutely. I think that's really key. And I think um, we've talked a couple of times here about moving away from just online sign up to uh, telephone based or even uh, in person sign ups. I've heard of places where people are even training people to go door to door. Um, and so I think that that might be a place to really take advantage of translation in terms of um, over the phone, making sure that those hotlines are staffed with people who have um, a variety of language abilities and um, maybe reserving some um, appointment slots for people for walk-ins, for instance, in case that's an easier way to, to communicate with someone who is maybe reading the translated materials. But I think that's absolutely key. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, George or Dr. Gales? Well, I was just gonna say that we at Bread have certainly you know, identified language access as a challenge. We have some access and, and capacity uh, but it's probably not adequate enough. I think my, my staff probably, even as we're speaking, are trying to uh, you know, um, partner with the DC government uh, and other sources to increase the uh, language access for immigrant populations, uh, particularly, I think we recently identified folks in the Asian community who we have a growing uh, number of folks living in one of the quarters, the quarter on 7th Street in Northwest DC, where that's, that population's increased. And we've seen more of those folks come to our agency and we need to increase our capacity to serve those folks uh, to a larger degree. So it's certainly, I think that is a part of, of sort of uh, an equitable solution when it comes to um, you know, getting the vaccine into the community. Thanks, George. Dr. Gales, I wanna pose um, another question that is in the Q&A box uh, to you. How can community-based organizations best partner with local health departments to take action that promotes equitable vaccine access and uptake? Sure, I think the first step is um, <clears throat> leveraging, again, those footprints in communities 
that those organizations have and recognizing we as the health department, one, may not be the best messenger, two, may not be able to translate it, not only in physically in the language that is spoken, but also in a way that resonates most with communities. And so, you know, you creating opportunities where we can partner to find out what issues are in the community. So for example, I think one of the things that we, one of the failures of the public health community early on with vaccine issues was, I think there was a lot of assumptions that people were hesitant to get vaccinated. And this, this is to Jenny's earlier point, because of history. We know history influences that, but we also know that people's lived experience that they're going through right now, as well as having different questions about, you know, just about the vaccine. And so I think we missed an opportunity to go meet people where they are and ask them, what are your concerns? As opposed to saying, well, we think this is what it's about. And so our messaging is focused solely on that. And I think partnering with community organizations, again, that have though our trusted venues within different communities creates safe spaces to have those conversations, again, as well as to you know, translate the message in whatever way uh, so that it, it resonates with the community and it hopefully addresses their questions and brings them back in. I think the second way that, that health departments can partner in that way <clears throat> is to utilize the expansive network of potential clinical volunteers, social support services. Uh, for example, if we are doing a partnering with a group to do a vaccine clinic, those clinics and organizations already have a full cadre and portfolio of other support services that could potentially address the other needs that people have. Because we know that vaccination is just one of them. But while you're here, do you have food to eat? Is your housing situation okay? How is your health insurance status? Can we help you get linked to the ACA or Medicaid or other services that you might have, given that we have you as a captive audience at that time? Thank you. There's so many questions I'm trying to funnel through to get to one final question, uh, giving our timing. Um, Oh, I, oh, so someone um, had a question uh, for Dr. Gales or for everyone. Um, this must have been an announcement today. We're moving to phase 2A in Maryland. Um, anyone 60 and up starting today. Do you think that this will help start to close the gap in terms of racial and ethnic disparities? Um, so maybe I'll pose that question to you, Dr. Gales, but George and Jenny, I'll ask you to think about follow up everyone uh, pretty briefly. What would help close the gap? Like what goes a long way to closing the gap? Is it the priority or is it something else? Um, and maybe we'll start with you, Dr. Gales. Well, I think it's a first step because you're increasing access <clears throat> to those who are eligible. You know, some of the things that folks talked about early on is that when we were seeing 75 and up is quite frankly, unfortunately, one of the great disparities in health outcomes is the life expectancy piece. So the fact that you see less black and brown folks at those age groups. And so, you know, that was one theory that if we increase age access, thereby it would increase diversity. But I, we can't just rest on that to be the, the solution for that. You know, we've got to, again, come up with and continue to promote strategies that do prioritize those spaces and spaces and places where folks live uh, and coming up with strategies to ensure that when we create those opportunities, we remove the obstacles and barriers for folks to be able to get in to make it easier and more seamless to do so. Again, I'll throw out that example of, you know, the mass vac sites. Again, we're hopeful to get one here in Montgomery County. I'm not speaking evil of mass vac sites, but what I want to be clear is just putting one in a community. We saw it, we've seen it in Prince George's. We've seen it in New York where they created one in Harlem and 90% of the folks who came were multiple hours outside of the city is that just increasing eligibility doesn't ensure that folks are still going to get be, have at fair access to those appointments to get the shots in their arms. So again, let's just not rest on the age strategy. Let's continue to promote those other strategies and best practices that we know have been effective at penetrating into communities to increase uh, vaccine uptake. Thanks. Uh, Jenny or George, quickly. I would also say um, making sure that the vaccines are available many hours of the day 
to accommodate work and caregiving responsibilities that um, a lot of the newly eligible groups might have, um, as well as um, making sure that vaccination sites are at places that people in know and trust, as we've discussed. So um, back to the language issue, immigrant serving organizations or schools where food pantries, places that people um, already know and, and use services and trust. And the last thing I'll say is that I'm seeing in a couple of instances where community members who, again, live in the communities where uh, some of the disparities play themselves out, they have, they are serving as ambassadors, particularly those who have now already had the vaccine and reaching out to, I literally, I was talking to somebody today who's generating a list of folks who they think will want to get the vaccine in their community and directing them to, there's a new a large access site that's coming up in, in Ward 8 in DC soon. And so I've got community members who are willing to literally reach out to their fellow community members, talk about, educate them about the center that's, that's coming up and getting them on a list. And so we do need to be really creative, I think, in terms of helping people um, get access to the, to the vaccine. Thank you, George. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Dr. Gales. Um, I just want to thank each of the panelists very much. Um, you know, when I opened, I opened with a quote from George. Um, and, and given what I heard today from each of you, I think it's important to close with that same quote. The pandemic has laid bare a second public health crisis, the full impact of systemic racism. And we're hearing systemic racism in lack of access to health care, disproportionate employment and higher risk jobs and in impacted industries, denser or multi-generational living conditions, all of which are playing into the disproportionate impact on black indigenous people of color. But I'm also hearing that when the process is done right, i.e. a process that doesn't rely on just technology as the only way for people to access um, the vaccines, a process that includes culturally competent and culturally specific organizations, when all those things come to play and when we move the myth of vaccine hesitancy as the factor aside, that's when we make real progress towards promoting equitable vaccine distribution. Um, I wanna thank all the panelists, Jenny, George, and Dr. Gales, again, for your incredible insights this afternoon. And I wanna thank everyone who registered and joined us today. Today's event is the second in a series of events on revitalizing and reimagining the DMV after COVID-19, where we'll continue to bring together subject matter experts and local change makers working on the ground to discuss policies that will help us focus not just on where we are today, but on where we wanna go, reimagining a DMV for all of its residents. Thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you all at the next event in the series.